The definition of a derivative is sometimes called Newton's quotient. And here's some notation. It's a limit. And it's basically that limit as h goes to 0 of finding that slope of that tangent line that we saw before. Here's some new notation. We would read this as f prime of a. And that means the derivative. So it's the limit as any number a gets close to 0. And a limit is a value that you can get arbitrarily close to, and we've seen that already. So what we're going to do now is find the derivative. And what the derivative is, is it's the slope of any tangent line at every p single piece of the graph. So if you took a parabola, There's a bunch of different tangents on here. So this is just y equals x squared. And if I drew a tangent line here, I'll just record the results over here. What's the slope of that line? Zero. Zero. So we would have that point on our derivative graph. If I took another point on here, you know, at 1 comma 1, that would be the slope. If you wanted to guess what you think that slope is, I don't know, estimate it. How steep of a line is that? 1. So then you would have a point at 1. OK? You're close. The slope is 2. But that's OK. If you picked another point, If you pick that point at 2, how steep do you think that slope is? And that would be another point on your graph. Now, what ends up happening is if we did this and we did it accurately, we would notice that all the slopes make a perfectly straight line. What's the equation of that line would help us find out what the slope is at any point. But we're going to get to that. And we've seen this alternative way of writing the definition of the derivative from our slopes and tangent lines. Again, another word for slope is gradient. So sometimes it's called a gradient function. And here are some notations that we'll get used to using. So sometimes we'll use function notation, f prime of x. Generally, we'll use that notation if we started off in function notation. If you started off with y equals notation, then you can either use y prime for the derivative or dy dx, which is called Leibniz notation. So we've got both Newton and Leibniz who are considered the founders of calculus two different notations that they came up with, and we use them both. And both have their advantage, well, they're, they're just notations, but there are some advantages and disadvantages of them. Like this one, you don't have to write very much. I consider that an advantage. This one, you have to write more. That's a disadvantage. Later on, in integrals, Leibniz notation kind of works out nicely. And so there it has an advantage. So what we're going to do is we're going to find and use the definition of the derivative to find f prime of x. And what's the difference of f prime of x compared to what we were doing yesterday? Yesterday, we were finding a specific slope at a specific point. Now we're going to start to look at, can we find a general slope for any general point? So the main thing is we're going to have to use our algebra skills. We're going to plug in our function into our definition of the derivative, expand using like terms, using algebra. And just like all of our limits up till now, we need to, going back to our equation in this form, we need to factor out an h on the top 
so that that H goes away. It's similar to the idea that we had before. So this, this formula here, okay, what that is looking like, if you take, for example, your parabola, and you take a point where you want to find the slope on that parabola, okay? We define h to be a small amount this way, and then if you had that small amount, you would have another point up here. So if this is the point x comma something on your function, then this point here would be x plus h comma f of x plus h. And so the top part of your limit is that length, that vertical rise. And the bottom part is defined to be h, that's your run. And as those points get closer and closer together, in other words, as this h value goes to 0, you get that instantaneous rate. What we're going to be doing different than we did before, before we plugged in an actual value, like 3 and then f of 3. What we're going to be doing now is plugging in a general value like x and seeing what happens. So here's our derivative, and we're going to start with x squared, that parabola that we started with. So what it means is if we're going to find our derivative, f prime of x, it's going to be the limit as h goes to 0, and our function is x squared. So in the first place where it says f of x plus h, that means in your function, you're going to replace every x with x plus h. So f of x plus h, in this example, means x plus h squared. f of x, in this case, is just x squared, all divided by h. Does the notation make sense to you at this point? Because this is important. Because this is, this is our function, f of x. In this case, it's x squared. So f of x plus h, that means x plus h squared. And f of x, you just replace it with x squared. We need to do algebra now in order to get that h to cancel out. So as far as, there we go. As far as notation goes, what we're going to keep doing is we're going to keep writing the limit as h goes to 0 until we can evaluate that limit. So we still have an h on the bottom here. If I expand x plus h squared, I would get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then I still have minus x squared. You can see that your x squareds will cancel out. And on the top, you'll just get 2xh plus h squared. And in that 2xh plus h squared, there's a common factor of h. So I'm going to take that out at the same time. We've done our algebra. Our main goal here was for this to happen, for that h to simplify on the bottom. Because while that h is on the bottom, we can't plug in 0 and evaluate it. But now that we've been able to simplify that h, we can now plug in 0 for h, and we'll get f prime of x is equal to 2x. The reason this is so powerful is when we did it abstractly by just putting in x, 
we now have a formula for every single point on that parabola. So when we drew it before, right, when we drew our parabola before, this one you could eyeball. This one you said, when x is 0, my tangent slope is 0. We can see that in the formula. If I plug 0 in for x, I get the derivative at 0 to be 0. That's telling me my slope is 0 at that point. At 1, 1, you estimated that slope to be 1. We now know that the slope of this line is 2. Because if I plug in 1 for x into this formula, f prime of 1 will equal 2. And so my slope will be 2 at that line. At 2, 4, the slope of that line will be 4. Because if you plug in 2 into this formula, you'll get 4. So this is way more efficient than the formulas we looked at yesterday. I mean, they're similar, but the formulas we looked at yesterday were all the time we had to plug in a value and redo all the work each time with that value. Now what we've done is we've plugged in the whole function. We've done the algebra with the whole function, and by simplifying it, we now have an equation for all the tangents, which is way more efficient than finding one at a time. So now that we've got that, well, what's f prime of 3? If f prime of 3 will equal 6, because f prime of x was equal to 2x, all we need to do is plug in 3 for x, and we get 6. Describe the meaning. So we'll want to use full sentences and words here. This means. This means the slope of the tangent at on our parabola, we have the point 3, comma 9. If we drew a tangent at that point, we would know that the slope of that tangent line is equal to 6. We can draw a picture of this. Here's the point 3, comma 9. That tangent line would have a slope of 6. And that would be the instantaneous rate of change of this function at that moment. So we've seen x squared. All we had to do was plug in our function into the formula and then work with that until our h's canceled out. So now the challenge becomes what happens with other functions? How do we work with a square root function? How do we simplify that? How do we simplify x cubed functions, different functions? Can we plug them into the formula? And do we have algebra skills that allow us to simplify this completely? Do you want to do one more together? Okay. So our definition is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. In this case, f of x, or our original function, is 3 root x. So we would have 3 root x plus h minus 
3 root x all over h. Yes? Right, yes, thank you. Notation wise, it's asking for y prime. And even though this is y equals, you can still write f of x plus h because that's what makes sense from the def definition. There is no notation when you just have a y that the formula works for. The formula has function notation within it. Ideas. We need to get the h's to cancel out. Well, we can't factor out an x to the one half here because that x has that plus h with it. You could factor out the three, yeah. So if you wanted to, we could have the three out in front leaving you with root x plus h minus root x all over h, sure. And the one main strategy we've seen so far with square roots is rationalizing. So I'm going to rationalize, and it wouldn't matter if you rationalized here with the threes or just here with the three factored out, but since we factored it out, and when you rationalize, you need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by this. Now our purpose was to rationalize our numerator. In the bottom of our function, I'm not going to multiply things out yet because my goal is to have that h canceled out, so it's nice to have it factored out all by itself there. Let's see what happens on the top when I multiply. Well, this is a difference of squares. So when you multiply it, you'll have x plus h minus x. Okay. Are we okay with that? Okay, I just want to make sure. On the top here, what happens when you multiply by a conjugate? So I have something minus something, and I'm multiplying by that same something plus something. That's the difference of squares, and when you multiply that out, it becomes a squared minus b squared. So what happens when you square x plus the square root of x squared, x, well, yeah, mm -hmm. What happens when you square the square root of x plus h? Well, the squaring and the square root cancel each other out. We just get x plus h. If you want to, you can add the square root here and the squared, but those things just cancel out, so it's like they just disappear. And the same thing with the root x times the root x, that just becomes x. Now what happens as a result on the top? The x's cancel, we're left with just 3h on the top, we have that h out. And the reason we didn't simplify this is because now those h's can cancel out. And at this point, you can evaluate the limit. Because now, if I plug in 0 for h, I'm no longer dividing by 0, and I will get 3 on the top and root x plus root x or 2 root x's on the bottom. So again, we have to use our algebra skills to expand. Sometimes we're going to need to rationalize the denominator, but our goal is to get that h to cancel out. And once that h cancels out, we can evaluate it. And now this tells us that no matter where we plug a point in on this function, okay, 
3 root x. You okay? Everybody know what the graph of 3 root x looks like? So you'll have it stretched by a factor of 3. So you have 4 comma 6, 1 comma 3, 0 comma 0. And it looks like that. That's your square root. This is the graph of 3 root x. It's your square root graph with a vertical stretch. Back to grade 12. Now, what does that mean if I want to find out, this looks like a nice pretty point to look at, how steep is that tangent line at that point? I can just plug in 4 for x here. And the slope of this line will be 3 quarters. Which is kind of neat. Why is that kind of neat? What kind of applications can we do with this? Well, just wait. Well, we're gotta, we'll get there. But we first have to get our skills really good with all derivatives. And with derivatives, we start to find that there's some patterns so that we don't always have to use the definition. And the definition will be, for those of you who have done this already, the definition is quite a bit longer than the methods we're going to learn. In other words, I don't know, how long did, how long did this one take us? Couple minutes, two minutes, three, three minutes, okay. On a three minute question, on a three minute question, you will probably be able to save 175 seconds with our new methods. Okay, which is crazy. Percentage wise, that's insane. We're going to be able to do it that much faster. Let's see if you've got this set up first. So what does it mean when you have f of x plus h? That means x plus h replaces both of the x's. I put things in brackets here, big square brackets. It's important that you see that you subtract these things. Now, how do you do x plus h cubed? Well, you could write it out, x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. And then do multiply two of them first, and then multiply all three of them, and combine all the like terms. You get x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed. Some of you have mentioned Pascal's triangle. Notice your 1, 3, 3, 1 happening here with x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. And the first exponent is going down by 1 each time. And the second exponent is going up by 1. So Pascal's triangle could also be used in this case. Which might be more helpful, especially if it got to higher ones, like you had an x to the 7. <laughs> Don't do that, please. Right. So we'll have to. So that means, after expanding this completely, I could now write that in for that part. And now let the simplification begin. So you expand everything on the top, 
things nicely simplify at this point right here when you look at the numerator every term has an H that allows you to factor that H out the H's cancel and then you can apply the limit because I can plug in 0 for H's and I'm left with 6x squared plus 4 this example in particular, in two weeks, you'll be able to look at the question and you will immediately say the answer without having to do much work or thinking at all. Why is that the Well, the, this, the idea, and when you get to university calculus, they'll do this even more to you. Okay? The idea is, how can we say that this is the derivative? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the definition. And mathematics is about, if we can start with something and prove that it's true, and we'll be able to say that the shortcuts that we'll get to have been proven to be true, then we can use those things to do things faster. Okay? There's your common denominator. It doesn't look pretty, but you've got to go through the steps of trying to get this to a single fraction. Lots of things. That's a little bit too much to cancel. So there, I'll, I have the whole thing up on there. I will, so it'll be on the video. I'll zoom in here so we can look at what did we do. We plugged things into the definition. We tried to get things as a single fraction. While getting a single fraction on the top, a whole bunch of things simplified. From this step to this step, I did two things at once here. What I did is I multiplied, because I'm dividing by h over 1, and we have a fraction divided by a fraction. That's the same as multiplying by a reciprocal. If you multiplied by 1 over h, that would move this h to the bottom and you have a single fraction. The top, everything cancels out and it simplifies to negative 5h. These h's then cancel out. That was the h that was causing us problems. So now you can plug in 0 for h and you get negative 5 over 2x minus 1 all squared. Go back to this. And this is where things work out well. But again, one little algebra mistake can really cause you a lot of pain because nothing works out then.